Welcome back to MVM, the show where we talk about all things board game related. Today we're excited to bring you a Kickstarter preview. This one is for Escape from Dolce from Sentient Cow Games. That's quite the name. Yes, Escape from Dolce and Sentient Cow are both interesting names. In fact, there is a Sentient Cow in the game. Exactly. So this is a cool game. It is a it is basically a dice chucker. However, the theme behind this one is you wake up in this base. You're not quite sure where you are. From a cryopod. Yes, and you are one of many different types of things. I mean, you could be, like you said, a sentient cow. You could be an alien. You could be a, a family that's molded together to look like an octopus. Yeah, or Amelia Earhart, for example. Yes, and it's really cool because all of these players have unique player powers or variable player powers. They all have their own dossier or file folder, which gives them those powers. Uh, tracks. They even have like stats of like like when you open the old GI Joe toys from years ago. <laughs> yeah. You look on the backside; they had those biographies of them. They've actually gone that far into this game. Yeah, the whole concept is hilarious, and they've definitely injected a really good sense of humor in every aspect of the game for sure. You're also the first thing you're gonna notice when you're looking at this. I mean, I could hide behind this thing. You have these <laughs> this base, and it is a 3D model of a five story base. Actually, a six story base because you're gonna start on the ground level. Yeah. But your idea is you start here, you wake up in this area, and you have to progress through this base and get out through the top. That's your way of winning in the normal campaign. Now, it's going to come with a bunch of different uh, extra scenarios yeah. or campaign mode that you'll be able to play through. You actually play the game with a scenario. You can play the game as a short campaign, which is about an hour to two hours, or you can play a long campaign, which is about three hours to play through. Yeah, and this game is a collaborative game, if we hadn't mentioned that. So yep. you're all working together to get through this whole thing. There's going to be boss fights. Yeah. There's going to be all sorts of fights with all sorts of different types of creatures. Like Jeremy said earlier, it is a dice checker, but in the most glorious and hilarious fashion. So let's talk about all these different components. As I, as I first mentioned, this is the base. It's a five-story base. You can't see, but underneath of it, uh, you can take this whole thing apart and flip it over and put them back in. That's because that differentiates the short campaign and the long campaign. The, the main difference is the long campaign has more rooms that you'll have to search mm. in each of these areas. Each of these levels has different types of iconography on it. That'll determine like what kind of uh, level of enemies you may face in those areas. Portals and that will allow you to go from one room to the next. And a bunch of different tokens that you can search and find uh, new pieces of equipment. Yeah, not only does this game progressively get more difficult depending on what level you're on, mm -hmm. but as you go through the game too, they have this really cool alarm level mechanism that ratchets up the difficulty of any card you might flip over. Everything basically escalates continually throughout the game, this feels very much like a classic co-op in that fashion. Again, when you're looking at these boards, you're going to notice a variety of different rooms. Each of them is separated by doors. This is how you're going to move your characters through them, including this area down here. You'll be moving through these areas, encountering things. When I speak about encountering things, there's a variety of different creatures or mobs that you'll be able to face. There's five main ones. You have lizard folk and gray aliens, guards, mutant hounds, and then robots. Right. The cool thing about this is that they're not all the same. Well, obviously, they're not the same between those different factions, but even within the own cards that they represent, they all have different stat lines on them. So they attack you in different ways depending upon which one comes out. Yeah, there's a really cool AI built into almost every single enemy card in the game. And like Jeremy said, uh, for instance, the grays here. You flip over one of those cards, depending on what room you come in, you might face one, you might face two, some other things as well. But each of those is going to behave in a slightly different fashion. Absolutely. Also, you have a combat. So there's a couple different boards out here that we see. We see the combat tracker board, the alarm board, the encounter, and a bunch of cards. We'll talk about this first. This combat tracker is actually going to track the combat within the game. It is a sliding scale with uh, the 11 being the highest and the 2 being the lowest. If you're in the higher um, side of it, you get to attack before the other things, and that's all determined by the creature that comes out, and then your own speed in the game plus a die roll, so it can be adjusted through the course of the game. And that speed can be increased. All your stat lines in the game can actually be increased. Yeah, it's really interesting, because like Jeremy said, this is basically the initiative track. Yep. So you're going to be filling this up based on every combat encounter that you enter into, and it's going to change things up depending on what creatures you flip, and what you roll for your initiative plus your base value. Each of these creatures has their own number in the upper left-hand corner. That's going to denote which one of these will come out, so you can very easily visually identify this card belongs to that mob which attacks on line number four, so right. you can see that. These cards will also tell you the special abilities of the enemy. They'll also have possibly some armor on some of them, and then how many hit points they're worth. 
Also, uh, down here, you have the alarm tracker. As David said, the more awareness you have within the base, the more people see you, uh, the more things you kill, the more things you encounter, your alarm's gonna go up. The idea is that that's kind of like the man in black trying to find you within right. this base. What that interacts with, though, is the encounter cards. Each of these encounter cards tells you what type of enemies you're going to encounter. Uh, this is a random card that can come up. It's going to have a random set of, of enemies on it. It's going to have a random event that you'll encounter, even some uh, ex experience points you'll get from killing them. But the cool thing is, depending upon your level, what alarm level you're at, that's even going to spawn different enemies. Yeah, the alarm level is going to affect almost everything on those cards. The experience you get, it depends on whether you're in green, yellow, or red. Mm -hmm. The enemies that come out, again, depends on where you are on that alarm level. And there are, of course, some things throughout the game that you can use to mitigate that alarm level and bring it back down. There's four different stacks of encounter cards, two that are off the side, so level one, two, three, and four. These are gradually gonna be introduced into the game depending upon what level, so it's very easy to see on this board. This is level one, level two, level three, and level four. So as you progress through the base, you're gonna fight harder and harder enemies. Also, the, the lines of text on there are gonna be more difficult, the things that you encounter. Right. So, you also have bosses. Each of these levels is protected by not only the five different types of mobs but a boss so as you try to get through the levels when you find the computer terminal that allows you to open up the portal to the next level you have to fight one of the bosses these are kind of enhanced versions of those particular mobs yeah they're associated with each of those mobs and like jeremy said you're going to be going through these levels there are tokens that we haven't mentioned that are out on each of these levels you're going to have to actually go through, uncover the right ones to basically move on. This is not a game about just going up the levels. You have to accomplish some things on each level and then move up to the next. And then between each is going to be basically a boss encounter, almost like a good video game. And that's just for the campaign. Now, as we said, there's going to be special missions that change that yeah. element within the game. Um, and of course, with any good type of this uh, of this type of game, you have loot. Yeah. And this game, I have to say, has a ton of different loot in giant stacks of cards. You have level one, level two, and level three loot. This loot is not just like your typical type of things. You have duct tape in here. You have wrenches. You have. Yeah, you you <laughs> you can't really even begin to list them all. I'm I picked up half of or a quarter of the first stack, and. They're all different that I've picked up here. I mean, it's amazing. And the art and all the different things that they do, it really gives a lot of flavor to the characters. And it's really cool because each of these players has particular types of things that only they can equip. So as you're searching through these different levels, there may be things that you can use, things that you can't use. Because, for instance, there's assault rifles, there's alien tech, there's ballistic weapons, there's specific type of armor and you look on your board and this is probably a good time to transition over to these file folders these as we said represent your character and on the bottom area it has a place for your weapon your armor your ability and your backpack each of these have icons telling you what kind of things right. you can equip and can't equip and a way again there's ways to upgrade these through the course of the game so if you can't equip an alien weapon at the beginning there are ways in order to equip that yeah, some of these icons too, obviously they're going to differ from character to character, and they're also going to tie into some of the special abilities your character have at the top of that sheet. My guy, Raylock Gylax, is a psionic alien, so if he can get a psionic weapon to channel sort of his psi powers, he has some particular unique attacks that he can use. Also on your file folder, you have your hit points across the top. You have your armor. There's ways to equip armor. When you equip that armor, it's naturally going to provide... Um, protection against weapons. On the bottom you have your leveling system. Now everyone starts at level one and each time that you either progress in the story by killing mobs or doing encounters within the game you're going to progress in experience points and there are certain points where you hit level two when you do this will go all the way back down to zero and it'll go up allowing you to do some upgrades on your stats. Now there's five or four different types of stats. You have strength, mental, accuracy, and speed. These allow you to equip more things in your backpack, to take more actions on your turn, to be able to um, have combat easier, to be able to hit uh, enemies. Right, the, the uh, mental and the accuracy come into play with combat. Mental with uh, the psi abilities, uh, accuracy with any weapon that you're gonna pick up. The other key thing for mental though is after an encounter, you're going to search rooms. Yeah. Uh, so if you don't have a high mental, 
you're going to basically be rolling checks against these stats to determine whether or not you find any loot. And like we said, that loot is fantastic. Yeah. So you definitely want to get your metal up. So let's talk about how the actual game plays. Now, again, we're not going to be talking about any of the secret missions, any of the um, variants to the gameplay. This is just the basic campaign. So this is how a round works. Uh, when you play, you first are going to seed the board. So you're going to you're going to build your tower according to whatever campaign you're playing, long or short. Everyone's going to start in the uh, level six. These won't be out here. We've kind of have a game in play, right. so to speak. So the very first thing that happens is you just always decide as a group uh, which player wants to walk into a room. Now there's no turn structure basically in the game. You can say you want to go. Do you want to go? It's whatever works best for the team. Whoever goes into that room is then going to take one of the encounter cards and they're going to flip up that encounter card and it's basically going to say what's in that room. Yeah, and basically before you do anything else, you're going to want to take a look at this encounter card. It has some nice flavor description at the top and then maybe some specific things that are going to happen immediately or after the fact. And then the key thing that we've mentioned already at the bottom here, you're going to see a green, yellow and red section. Depending on player count and what alarm level you're at, you're going to populate that room with some enemies. Yeah. This one, for instance, has two guards and a mutant in the green level for a four-player game. So we've put two guards and a mutant in that room. And what happens here is you're going to draw those cards. As we said, each of these cards has variations to those mobs. We've drawn two guards and one mutant, and it tells you where to seed on the combat track, basically the initiative for that round. The next thing that happens is you're going to raise the alarm level. Yeah. Every encounter that you have naturally raises the alarm level by one unless the card says not to do so. There's some other things that happen. Not only does that seed the board with random encounters the higher you go up in that alarm level, but there's also random stats that can happen depending if you're on yellow or red. We're not going to go into those right now, but basically they're going to produce more mobs for right. you uh, the more awareness you have within there. Then you're going to reveal any objective tokens that you have in that room. Now, some of these may have face down tokens, which you're going to randomly seed on the board. These tokens can be portals into the next level. They can be computer terminals. They can be uh, cryopods, which basically will heal you or allow you to clone. And the last one are like supply crates, which will allow you to go through that loot deck and find new things. Yeah, exactly. The room we've gone into doesn't have one of those. So the next thing you're going to do is start to get ready for combat. Yep. In addition to the initiative of the enemies that came out on the board, everyone's also going to roll their six-sided die, add that to their speed yep. to determine where they're going to be placed on the initiative track. You're going to roll the dice. You're going to take your token and place it out there. And like Jeremy said at the beginning, the higher you are, the sooner you're going to go. Now, in this case, the, one of the guards and myself is on the same level. The nice thing is it's a cooperative game. Yep. The players get to decide who's going to go first when there's people on the same level. Combat's pretty simple to do. The very first thing you're going to do is you're going to decide who you're going to attack. The number of actions that you get on a round uh, during combat, again, depends upon your speed. So that player who breaks open in that initial room takes one of their actions to enter that room. They're also probably going to be the first one to do combat in yeah. that room. Again, combat is determined by your speed. Now, you're going to look down at your player board and see what kind of weapons you may have available. No matter what kind of weapon you have, you're always going to roll 1d6. And the idea here is that you're trying to roll equal to or less than your accuracy to be able to hit that player. Now, it really depends on if you have a melee weapon or if you have a ranged weapon. If you're in a melee rip, uh, room, if you have a melee weapon, you have to be in the same room. If you right. uh, have a ranged weapon, you can shoot out into a different room. And there'll be times when things spawn away from you, not just in the room that you are in. Um, and then if you hit them, again, if I roll a 3 and my accuracy is a 4, that's a hit. Now, depending upon the weapon that I used, that's the important part to understand how the, the damage is right. done within the game. Each of these weapons may have a variable to it, allowing you to do something with it, but it also is going to have a die that is particular to that attack. This is a white die, so I'm going to roll the white die to determine how much damage that I actually do to that creature. Yeah, it's interesting, and I'll note this now, even though it's not part of combat, but Jeremy said some of these weapons have some interesting text at the bottom. For instance, I have this wrench that has one white die of damage also, but at the bottom it says good for plumbing and cracking alien skulls. <laughs> the plumbing part might come into play with some narrative that comes out yep. in the game. So depending on what items you have, even weapons, which you may not think might be useful for other things, they might come into play in order to do some and things. And speaking of that, you're going to find some really random objects like peanut butter. And you're going <laughs> to wonder, what can you do with peanut butter? There's, there's allies over here that 
if you have peanut butter, it may draw those allies and they'll stay with you on that level. And if you give them the things that they like, like records or, uh, or, or peanut butter, for instance, they'll follow you into the next level. And they also have their own combat abilities and stats. Yeah, and again, uh, these allies are probably some of the more hilarious aspects of the game, too. I have one here that's Mikey the Goat Boy. Yeah. As you can get a sense, this they really have a sense of humor with all the things they have, have going on here. They have Sasquatch, they have a Mothman, all, something that kind of resembles a Teenage Mutant Ninja yeah. Turtle. Um, but the allies are really interesting. And like Jeremy said, you can pick up peanut butter and all sorts of different items here. It gives the game a bit of that graphic adventure flavor. If you ever played those old games from yesteryear, you pick mm -hmm. up an item, you're like, what on earth is this going to be good for? And it might be good for something. As we said, you're going to go through that initiative, tra initiative track doing attacks. Now, when an enemy will attack you, you're simply going to look and see which alien it, it may be. And then you're going to look at their particular card. Now, each of these cards has a variety of different things on it. The first thing you want to know is how many actions that alien or that, that mob basically gets against you. And then it's going to tell you what you need to be able to hit against it. But it's also going to have some line items for the types of attacks that it does. Some of them are melee, so you have to be in the same position, or this creature has to be in the same position as one of the players in order to do it. It may also say the person who has the most hit points left, or the person who has the highest strength. So it's going to tell you what it does. If it can't do that, it's going to move into the room that's available to do it, or skip down to the next possible line and do that attack line. Right, and once you've got a handle on this, it really becomes a nice little AI for all of these guys, yeah. because during combat, Interestingly enough, these things will move around the board, move from room to room, and you can use that against them. Yes. You know, you can kind of look at their attacks and go, okay, we can manipulate this so that we're basically dodging him and he's moving from room to room and never being able to attack. Eventually, probably will, but there are some really cool, interesting layers to the combat that way. So you're going to keep going through combat. Um, at the end of the combat, for every enemy that you kill, so if I... Being Adam Starblaster is able to kill enemies, I get one experience no matter what enemy it is that I kill. Plus, you get group experience depending upon the encounter card. At the very bottom of those encounter cards, it tells you how much experience each of those levels are. So a level, um, if it's on the green level, it may only give us two group experience, right. but if it's on a red, it may give us four. Uh, and then once that's done, you get to search the room. Yeah, this is where the loot comes in. And searching the room happens for everybody. Basically, the way this game works is when you're out of combat, you're pretty much doing what you want. Yep. You're not limited to the number of actions that are on your character sheet until the next round of combat. But when you search, everyone's going to be able to search twice yes. a room. And you're going to roll your six-sided die. And like I said earlier, you're going to check that against your mental ability. If your mental ability is low, you're probably going to come up empty a lot. Yeah. My mental ability is a four. So I'm a two, so I'm awful. <laughs> as long as I roll, there, I rolled a four. Four or less, I'm going to find something. You're going to take something off of the uh, loot deck. Yeah. Uh, if you can equip it, you're going to equip it right then. You can trade it with other players if you're in the same space. You can also put it in your backpack. You can hold X number of things in your backpack equal right. to your strength. Uh, and then you're going to put a cleared room token on the area. That place can't be searched again. And you're going to keep doing this round after round, trying to find the computer terminal, trying to open that computer terminal and then get to the portal. That portal will allow you as a group to progress to the next level. So you'll be moving from six to five, then over to that board to four, three, two, and then one, trying to progress. Again, at the end of each of these levels, you are gonna find one of the boss monsters. These boss monsters are basically better versions of the normal creatures within the game. Yeah. And you're going to do that until the end. Now, we didn't talk about any of the secret missions, of course. There's going to be a large variety of those that change the gameplay quite drastically, give you new objectives in the game, and not just a race to get out of the base. Yeah, this game is really about variability. There's a lot of different things going on. We didn't even show you all of the characters you can choose. Yeah. And even across those characters, there's a lot of different ways that you can develop those as you're playing the game. The loot decks we can't say enough about. I mean, there's three different loot decks here. They're all massive and they all have a wide range of items that you can pick up. And again, you're gonna be hunting for those items that really synergize well with the stats that your character has. Yeah, I mean, I, th these file dossiers are really cool yeah. too. And the way that the leveling system work, I, I really enjoy that for the fact that when you level, you have options. You don't get everything in that line item. You have to choose. And when you choose, it could be increasing your, your baseline for your hit points, or it could be adding a token to one of these stat levels, increasing your stat level in that area. So there's a lot of ways that you can enhance your character that's different from one game or one campaign to the next campaign. Yeah, it gives really a lot of the flavor you'd get from a, a really long 
RPG style game mm -hmm. in terms of leveling your character up in a much more bite sized you know, sit down and play the campaign fashion. You really get the, the experience of evolving this character in a very short period of time. Very cool game. This one's called Escape from Dolce from Sentient Cow Games. If you guys have any questions about the game, make them in the comments below. Subscribe to us, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, everything else that we do, and we'll catch you guys next time. Bye-bye. Season 2 of Man vs. Meeple is sponsored in part by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.